Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Montana Free Press Fest. My name is Zeke Lloyd. I'm a wildfire reporter with the Montana Free Press. Excited to welcome you all here today. Uh, I want to take a brief moment to thank our sponsors, the UM School of Journalism, the REN, the Montana Community Foundation, the Bacchus Institute, the Mike and Maureen Mansfield Center, and the University of Montana. You are here for a breakout session administrators, school board members, and Montana State legislators about funding for education and the Treasure State. I'm very excited to introduce your moderator, Alex Sackerson, who is the education reporter for Montana Free Press. He spent the last decade in the local wilds of Montana. In his free time, Sackerson splits the Sackerson splits his free time between Missoula's ski slopes and the tri quiet trout waters of the Rocky Mountain Front. Ladies and gentlemen, Alex Sackerson. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thanks, Zeke. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just dive right into it and introduce my panelists here. Um, First off, uh, to my immediate right, we've got uh, David Beatty, uh, who has served in the Montana State House as representative for House District 86 since 2019. A fourth generation Montanan, Beatty studied civil engineering and economics at Montana State University before serving in the US Army for a 30 year tenure, retiring as a colonel and returning to the Bitterroot to join a small startup engineering firm for which he is CFO. Beattie earned two master's degrees in national security studies and a PhD in space physics, and was a professor of physics at West Point. A member of the Hamilton School Board for nine years, Beattie has also served as, a, as the chairman of the Joint Appropriations Subcommittee for Education and the Education Interim Budget Committee. Welcome, David Beattie. <clears throat> this is really nice. Uh, <laughs> you're in order. Um, Becky Krogan is an elementary teacher and the local union president in Belgrade, Montana. A native of Montana, she earned degrees in early childhood education and public administration from Montana State University and a master's in teaching from the University of Washington. With experience in educational leadership and a deep commitment to advocacy, Becky works to ensure that educators and students have the resources they need to succeed. Please welcome Becky. You guys really are in order. This is great, You're making my job easy. Uh, doc Dr. Arlene Walker Andrews attended the University of Texas at Austin for her undergraduate degree and then completed her PhD in psychology at Cornell University in 1981. She taught in the psychology department at Rutgers University for 22 years, where she conducted research on infants' perception and cognition. In 2003, she moved to Missoula, Montana as the associate provost at the University of Montana. She retired from that position in 2014 Arlene is a member of the Missoula County Public Schools Board of Trustees and a director for the Montana School Boards Association. She is married to Dr. David Andrews. They have two adult children who both work in education. Please welcome Arlene. <clears throat> and down on the end, we've got Rob Watson, who currently serves as the executive director for School Administrators of Montana. SAM is a nonprofit organization that serves professional development and advocacy needs for more than 1,000 school leaders in Montana. Previously, Rob served as a school superintendent in Bozeman and Missoula. With more than 30 years of experience in K-12 public schools, Rob believes in the power of education to change lives and help all students experience success. Please welcome Rob. <clears throat> All right, uh, now before we get started with the questions, I wanted to give everybody a little quick and dirty primer on education funding in Montana. We're not gonna get too into the weeds with this panel uh, because it's a complicated subject, um, but uh, essentially, let's see, there we go. So essentially budgets are crafted at the local level with, floor, with the floors and ceilings set by lawmakers using a long-standing state funding formula. More on that in a minute. Uh, where does the money come from? Well, about 36% comes from local property taxes. Think the levies that you all vote on uh, every once in a while. And about 40% comes from various pots at the state level, which include revenue from state trust lands and money from the general fund. 
Uh, the funding formula, as you can tell, is incredibly complex. <laughs> Um, and it's got a lot of levers and pulleys that state lawmakers can use to balance things out, equalize across districts. Um, all of this is really in the service of a promise made in Article 10 of the Montana Constitution that charges the legislature with providing a free, high quality public school system for all Montanans. Um, but then we get around to the question of how is this working today? Uh, districts recently, if you've been paying attention to the news, uh, have been facing, you know, significant budget deficits. Um, enrollment statewide and even nationally is declining. And uh, we had about $600 million in federal COVID relief funding come into the state of Montana that as of the end of this month expires. And so this has all sort of created some very, you know, high-level conversations, um, and also a lot of conversations at the local level. And that's what we're really here to discuss today, is you know, how the state funding formula is working, the reality out on the ground for educators, and how all of this is trickling back up to the conversations around state policy that are going to be happening in the 2025 legislative session and during a decennial review of the state funding formula, which, which will come after. This is a state-mandated review that takes a in-depth look at how Montana is funding its public school system. So with that, I wanted to ask each of you, and I can get a volunteer to start, what is the current state of funding in Montana's public schools today? And we've got some microphones down there for you guys too, so anybody want to start us off? I guess I'm going to go ahead. <laughs> um, I would say that the current state of um, funding in Montana is at a crisis. Um, speaking as a teacher in our schools, um, we don't have enough staff to make sure that our students are receiving the best quality education that they can. And that goes from um, custodians and lunch staff um, to paraeducators all the way up to teachers and specialists like special educators, school psychologists, speech pathologists. Um, and when you don't have enough staff, the people that you do have are working well beyond the level that they should be um, and the burnout is real. Um, and so the lack of funding that we have in our schools right now is creating a crisis point. Our teachers are leaving the state. Um, our, People can't afford to be in positions in schools um, because they pay so poorly. Um, so we are hemorrhaging our teachers. We are losing staff, and it's um, we're at a breaking point, and it's it's scary. And I'm worried about our future. I just thought it was very appropriate that the person who introduced this all is the wildfire. Um, reporter, because that's sort of what it feels like from the school board level. Um, she was mentioning the problems with uh, teachers not being able to afford to live here, etc. From the viewpoint of somebody at just Missoula, we had to cut more than 60 positions this year. Originally, we thought it would be closer to 90, but we managed to only cut 60 positions, 10 of which were uh, administrative level, another six is sort of central, and then finally you get into teachers uh, and paraprofessionals that you also have to cut. Um, and so for us, it's, it's really very difficult as well. Uh, we started the year with about a four and a half million dollar deficit in just regular funding on top of losing five million dollars of ESSER funding that had been used sort of to plug holes over the last several years. And so starting from there with a $140 million budget, 90% of which is uh, personnel, makes it difficult to make any kind of plans. Um, that's enough for right now. <laughs> yeah, and <clears throat> I, I won't add a whole bunch more. I think it was well stated. I had an opportunity the last two days to travel to some rural areas of our state. So I can tell you this issue is not just a Missoula or Bozeman issue. This is affecting all parts of our state. Uh, I was in Glasgow and spoke to 20 
school districts up there at a meeting and um, asked a simple question, how many, how many teachers did they have that were on emergency authorized certification? And so just a little background on that, um, we have several different types of certification levels in Montana. Uh, fully certified, we have provisionally certified, which is somebody that's working towards their teaching certificate. They're in a, in a program to get their teaching certificate. And then we have one step below that. We have emergency authorized. And emergency authorized is a teacher that um, doesn't have a teaching certificate and is not working on a program. Uh, they happen to probably have a bachelor's degree or hopefully some college towards a bachelor's degree. Um, but they live in the community and they are willing to, to be there. Um, in the districts I spoke with, we had one district there in Northeast Montana that had 12 emergency authorized teachers. And remember, that's one step below a provisional. And those folks um, don't currently have a pathway towards, uh, towards certification. Now, that particular school only has about 30 staff members total. So 12 out of 30 uh, were emergency authorized. So when I spoke to superintendents both there and on the high line, um, I heard words that, that Becky shared, crisis situation. Uh, one of the superintendents felt like they were dying on the vine. That was the feeling that they expressed, being unable to um, support teachers and get enough staff members in the building. Well, I have to say that I largely agree with my co-panelists here. Uh, prior, to, um, prior to the COVID pandemic and the infusion of you know, half a billion dollars of uh, federal fund funding into the system. I think that there were pressures building on the within the current funding formula at that point. I don't think they were quite as evident. And uh, and uh, I, I, w I gotta say, the overall structure of the funding formula that we have, which we will not get into the details on, you know, basically is, is modeled, uh, it has a business model sort of idea to it. It has a fixed cost component that you, that districts get because they're a district, and then there's a, a, a component that is based upon enrollment, and, it, and this makes perfect sense. And so in the, in the instance where there's declining enrollments, one would expect the funding uh, requirement to eventually go down, but of course th that's nuanced because uh, uh, the funding, uh, as, as, as enrollments decrease, uh, you don't automatically get a, a reduction in cost because you don't cut teach fractions of teachers. But that's, that, I mean, maybe too much into the weeds. Um, <laughs> now, but then the COVID uh, epidemic uh, took place, and I think that this scrambled uh, 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 finances within the districts. We had an infusion of money that we're still trying to, uh, and I'm looking forward to a report from the Superintendent of Public Construction a week after next uh, to explain uh, exactly how that money was, uh, was put out in, in detail. Uh, to the districts and some programs they ran there. I mean, I, I think it was largely used wisely, but we want to look into that as well. But this, I think, gave legislators a false sense of security concerning the uh, the state of funding within the schools. I, I just want to be straightforward, and, and I, I am a legislator, and I, I actually work in education policy, and so I, I am not going to say that I was the smartest guy in the room, because I sure as hell wasn't in this particular case. Um, but. Uh, that, that all being said, I, th I think where I come down in terms of, of looking forward uh, to dealing with an immediate situation is I'm, I'm looking forward to what sort of long-term structural changes do we have to make in educational funding uh, down the road. And uh, so here's a spoiler. Th this will not be resolved. The long-term problem will not be resolved in the next legislative session. It is too complicated a problem. That's why we have in law the requirement that every 10 years there a thorough evaluation of the funding formula be done so that we can understand uh, not only funding, but also start correlating what our expectations are in the schools at the same time, because expectations drive what we expect schools to do. Uh, and, and of course, the funding should align with that. And, and, and that's looking forward to the 10-year or decennial study is, is I, I think where the real action is going to be, and so we're working on making sure we get, we, we're ho hopeful to get the right legislators onto that committee so that we can have a productive decennial study. That being said, in the short term, we have a lot of 
I use a different term, angst within the school districts across the state. As the ESSER funding has gone away, uh, you know, if, if programs were created uh, for, uh, that, that schools have adopted that they wish to continue uh, with the ESSER funding going away, I mean, it, we're not going to be able to solve that particular problem. Uh, it was one-time money, and that's and and that's the way it goes. The one thing that uh, the one uh, ray of hope that I might offer here is that there are several of us us currently working on legislation to introduce next session that uh, addresses what I think is the immediate problem, and that is adjusting for uh, inflation. Uh, the current funding formula to, has a cap on the inflation adjustments that we can make, which was low enough that it was never a problem up until we had the spike in inflation. And, and frankly, based upon uh, the um, uh, projections for inflation, it won't be a problem down the road because of the averaging process. But they, we immediately put the schools behind because we didn't, uh, because our our read of the funding formula with its cap did not uh, allow. Uh, uh, this is arguable, but uh, we stuck with the funding formula and the inflation adjustments as they were. We're looking at infusing uh, uh, some money, probably in the terms of fifty to seventy-five million dollars into the base in, into the K-12 funding. Uh, to accommodate that uh, uh, in the short term. And that funding will be, uh, uh, and, and the way we're crafting the legislation is that a significant portion of that funding will be devoted towards increasing starting teacher pay. Uh, another component will be towards um, recognizing that providing students advanced opportunities, for instance, college credits, or industry recognized trade credentials generally is a cost, more costly endeavor and we intend to uh, we intend to infuse more money into the process for that and we're also examining uh, uh, some sort of a housing stipend program if you will this is more complicated I don't believe that this would apply to every district because frankly the housing problem is not the same in Bozeman or Hamilton as it is somewhere in some small town in eastern Montana. So trying to figure out how to put a housing program, uh, a housing stipend program into a, and provide funding for that. Who would be eligible, what, you know, what the conditions for eligibility would be, um, make sure that we don't create a system where ad adjacent districts are able to pay their teachers more and hence poach people from other districts. It's, mo it's probably the most complicated portion of this. But we're working through that. and. Uh, uh, the lead legislator on that is going to be uh, is Representative Lou Jones uh, out of Conrad, and uh, I expect I, I've asked him to provide a, a a draft of that, a working draft of that, a week after next when the Education Interim Budget Committee uh, meets, so that we can uh, take a look at it. This is important enough. If we want to have a sort of immediate, so uh, more or less, this school year is water under the bridge. Okay, but if we want to have uh, immediate, uh, or as immediate uh, uh, effect as we can, we need to have legislation ready to go to hit the hit the the uh, uh, House floor uh, first thing in the session and get it on the governor's desk as quickly as we can. Uh, for instance, the enhancement to the starting teacher pay piece, we would like to have that effective uh, for the school year or for the fiscal year starting on June 1, 2025. Uh, but we won't be able to really get that sort of thing done unless we can get the legislation. And that was a mouthful, and I'm out of energy now. Can I, can I add just one quick little thing? Because we said we didn't want to get into the weeds, but given that the budgets are so heavily um, based on the number of students, which makes perfect sense if you look at it you know, from afar, I just wanted to point out that what happens with schools is a little like if you're a family of five and your oldest child moves out, um, your budget for food may go down, particularly if it's some guy, 18-year-old, that weighs 200 pounds. But your mortgage doesn't go down. Your electricity doesn't go down. All of those things stay the same. So when we lose a few students, they're usually not all in the same classroom and therefore you still need the same number of teachers, the same electric bill, which also went up 28%, et cetera. Okay, well, I mean, you guys are taking care of a lot of my questions in one go, <laughs> making me uh, have to be fast on my feet. Um, well, 
So thank you for all of that. Um, I, I did want to turn to Arlene and Becky really quick, and, and you already mentioned some specifics, but given this backdrop, a little bit of the look forward. I, I did want to ask for a little more context on like how these changes, how you've seen these changes manifest out on the ground in public education, Becky in your classrooms and in your conversations around you know negotiating for teacher salaries and such in your district. And Arlene, how you've seen this you know unfold at the board level when it comes to you know, crafting budgets, when it comes to making tough decisions, when it comes to getting public feedback during those meetings. I wanted to have you two kind of talk a little bit about the ground perspective here. Yeah. <clears throat> I think um, as far as negotiations go, when we, we sit down at the table, I think um, starting teacher pay is one aspect of it. Um, but we can raise starting teacher pay um, as, as high as we want. But if we don't address the rest of the salary schedule and the other people that are in the room, um, we'll continue to lose teachers. And so one of the things that um, I'm kind of going into this year as we um, in Belgrade will start negotiations is um, uh, retention is the new recruitment. <laughs> and we need to retain our teachers. Um, and what's happening in Belgrade in particular is we might get brand new teachers in um, from MSU, oftentimes they'll come in because um, they've been living in Bozeman. They, you know, understand how much it costs. But then they start their career and they realize I'm never going to be able to start a family here. I'm never going to be able to sustain a family here, and so they leave. They leave the the state, um, or oftentimes, sometimes we'll lose teachers to Bozeman. And part of why we lose teachers to Bozeman is because they're able to pay six thousand dollars more on average. Um, than we are in Belgrade, um, and part of that is the school funding formula and, and being able to pass levies, um, and different communities have different levels of support for education, and um, Bozeman has historically been able to pass almost every single levy, whereas Belgrade has fought tooth and nail for every levy that we have been able to pass. And when I say fought tooth and nail, I mean teachers are literally standing on the street corners with signs begging our community to pass our levies. And it's on the backs of our teachers <laughs> to pass our levies. And that's hard. And I think that's, when I say it's a crisis, I think that's where I'm coming from um, going into this negotiations. And I, I understand the decennial study is coming up. And I think school funding is so incredibly complex that yes, a, a decennial study is important and necessary. My fear is if we put too much weight on the, the fixing the problem in the decennial study, the result of that doesn't come down to schools until 2027 at the earliest, and that's too late to fix some of our challenges. Well, as you were talking, I had about 55 different things go through my head <laughs> that I feel like I need to say, but that's impossible. Um, first of all, Missoula has been very... Um, supportive and continues to be very supportive of its schools, and most of our levies have passed. On the other hand, we're in the very strange position of, and this is something I find odd, that the we're told sort of what our maximum budget can be, and then 80% of that money is provided, but then you need to go out for an operational levy to bring in the other 20%. And so if that levy should fail, you're in very deep trouble. Now, we're lucky enough in Missoula that that has not happened. But before I even came on the board during COVID, the board, for example, made a decision not to go out for that levy because people were in such um, bad straits in a community that to ask them to come up with that money, uh, they deemed was, was just not a good thing to do, which of course put the school further and further behind. Again, the ESSER funding uh, was helpful because it was used for things like hiring um, uh, behavioral interventionists. And the reason that I mentioned the behavioral interventionists right off the top is that then when we first started talking about having to get rid of positions, one of the first group to get, quote, rid of were intervention specialists. Not because anybody wanted to, but because they were the people hired with ESSER funding that weren't already there. So we had several meetings in which we had a couple of hundred people come out 
concerned about particular positions that were being um, potentially done away with. Um, intervention specialists, behavior specialists, were among those that people felt strongly were needed as kids were recovering and still are from the effects of COVID isolation. Um, and then positions that people value greatly in this town, but that needed to be looked at because you can't let go classroom teachers. And so what are you left with? Positions that may be very important, but seem that are beyond the classroom. So uh, we had several meetings that went on to midnight with many people asking us not to make specific cuts. And that's very difficult. So I think, as I said before, Missoula is in a very good position compared to many places because it does get a lot of community support. Um, but even so, people don't want certain things to happen. And the board has to sit there and make these decisions. Um, and we usually, after much discussion, come out to pretty unanimous decisions, but we didn't get there quickly. Uh, and it does take a lot of time and effort and, and looking at the budgets. And of course, the budget, every time I, when I drove in this morning, I was like, what was our budget? Only because it changes every meeting because of year-end balances and changes here and there. And it's sometimes difficult to even remember what changed. So for example, when I said that we were, we started off, well, here's a, here's a figure for you. In Missoula this last year, the people through their property taxes put an additional $9.8 million into the state. At one point, it looked like we, as a school district, were going to enjoy $450,000 of that. So 9.8 additional dollars out of Missoula with the school only getting 450,000 of that. That actually went up as enrollments changed and lots of other things changed, but it was still, say, a million dollars out of that $9.8 million. And there's a good reason for that in that there are many districts um, next to state lands or a military base or without a lot of corporations who don't have the same kind of tax base that we do. And so it gets spread out among all these different districts. But that still doesn't make it easier to explain to people in Missoula that even though your property taxes went up, we don't have the money to do all the things you want us to do. Another long-winded reply. Yeah, and I, I don't want to get too much into to guaranteed tax base aid and everything. Like I said, we're trying to avoid too many weeds. Um, but hearing all this, I mean, there are a lot of very you know real concerns at the at the local level. Um, and you know, David, for you and for Rob as well, um, you know, when it comes to the statewide perspective, when you're having these you know policy conversations, how important is it? to you know you know elevate these these details to to consider these and and how difficult it is is it to balance those against you know the very real financial constraints that a state budget can face thanks <laughs> well i think that at the state legislature level we certainly uh are made well aware of what the concerns are locally. And, you know, I was a school board trustee, so I, 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 I live in a community and I understand the, the, the kind of dynamics that are going on there. Um, it, it does cut down to, uh, you know, it, it, at the state level now, it gets down to balancing, uh, balancing requirements. I mean, we have requirements for mental health, uh, corrections, and that sort of thing, and so there isn't an infinite pot of money. Now, that being said, uh, within the basic school funding formula, because there are funding to the schools outside of the funding formula that we won't get into, but, they're, but that are substantial, um, you know, the way to understand the state uh, uh, funding formula is it's really in place to, first of all, as was mentioned earlier, define what the minimum level of funding support 
for the operating budget for a school district is going to be, but it also defines a cap on that as well. And that is all based upon uh, constitutional equaliz uh, equalization requirements uh, and, and equity requirements. So the state funding formula defines both of those things, and it's in statute, and it's self-executing, and it's supposed to be self-executing. It was put in place that way in, in response to uh, litigation that took place 20 years ago or so. Um, now within, and, and, so the, and so the question now becomes, we define what the, you know, how much funding has to be provided. The next question is who pays? And, uh, and the who pays department, uh, up to that 80% of the cap, that minimum requirement of funding, is a, is a combination of uh, levies that are the 95 mil levy, the statewide property tax levy, which as was pointed out earlier, does not come back in proportion to what, what your uh, district pays, but is actually used in order to provide equity across uh, school districts across the state, and which, which was well explained earlier. So you have the 95 mil levy money coming in, and to the extent that it's, it's available and there's some uh, 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 you know, $50 million plus from the school trust lands that come in, the rest of it is, is income tax money that gets you up to the 80% line. If you want to go higher than the 80%, you're in, the, in that area where it's now discretionary. Oh, by the way, let me, let me back off. There's also a district uh, a property tax to, to get to the 80% line, and the size of that will depend upon your ability to pay. You get more state equalization money uh, if you're a, a poor district, relatively speaking, and, and, uh, and, and, your, uh, and your taxpayers have to pay less in their mandatory levy. To go beyond that, to get beyond that base level requires support of your community. And this was done by design. Uh, it is property tax money exclusively as it stands right now. And, uh, and it's, you know, that is, a, that is an element of, uh, of our culture that I guess it is related to local control and, and, and a community's willingness to support, its, to, to support its schools. So any discussions of funding of, of our schools uh, you know, gets down to who pays in the final analysis. Okay, um, I I think it's <clears throat> I think it's really easy for all of us to um, start being very critical of the funding formula, and I'm I'm going to try not to do that as much as possible, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, Alex said in my bio that I believe in the power of education to change lives. And the reason I always put that in my bio is, is, is pretty simple. Uh, my mom was educated in a one-room schoolhouse outside of Miles City, Montana. Anyone been to Miles City before? And um, had it not been, and there's still a lot of one-room schoolhouses in Montana, by the way. But had it not been for the teacher in that one-room schoolhouse, um, she would not have learned how to read. Um, the teacher also taught my grandmother how to read so she could pass her citizenship test. Uh, and it was that teacher that made a difference in my mom's life. Um, and I wouldn't be sitting here today had it not been for that. That happened so many years ago. So I'm telling you that because while our funding formula is not perfect, what it does do is it provides that equalization across the state, provided that opportunity for my mother uh, granted, back then it was probably a different funding formula, but it did have a, a sense of that equalization. Take a look at our 1972 constitution that guarantees the, the right for every child in the state to get an education. And our funding formula, while not perfect, does provide that equalization. And I have always appreciated that. What I've noticed, and I think this gets to Alex, Alex's question, what I've noticed now is that the one size fits all that might be part of our funding formula or might be part of a strategy that we wanna use in our funding formula doesn't always work in every single school across the state. Doesn't work for large schools, doesn't work for small schools, and there is no one size fits all. The only reason I know that is I um, have spent the last three falls uh, traveling the state and talking to folks in schools and asking them how the funding formula is working or not working. And what I'm finding out is it's not working for large schools and it's not working for small schools. And until you sit across from folks in, the, in, the, in their boardrooms or in their classrooms and have that conversation, 
Uh, it's really hard to, for me at the state level to come up with one solution that's gonna be perfect for everybody. We can make some tweaks to the funding formula and I really do respect the work that the legislature is doing and is going to do to try, try to make tweaks to that funding formula. I think that will help. But at the end of the day, what we need is a large, large infusion of money into the system. And you can see that by not even having to go very far away. North Dakota, and I hate to say this as being from Montana because we always made jokes about North Dakota. Do you remember that? North Dakota puts over 300 million more into their K-12 system than we do. Washington, over 300 million nationally to over 200 million into their K-12 system nationally. So we need an infusion of money to really reach that goal to make sure every kid gets a chance to learn and succeed. And I know that that's, that might be coming in the decennial study, there might be a piece of that coming in the 2025 legislature, but we have some great ideas in Helena until I get outside of Helena and tell them what the idea is and they say to me, Rob, that's not gonna work. And they're able to show me on paper why it doesn't work. So those are the conversations we have to continue to have. We have to share those with our legislature to, to find that, that better solution. Well, I, I absolutely agree on uh, the, the point that uh, one size doesn't fit all and I think you know, we, we may have been more homogeneous 20 years ago than we are now with, with regard to our housing costs, with regard to our economy and that sort of thing. Um, I'll push back a little bit. I mean, you could look at adjacent states that spend a hell of a lot less money on, on our schools, Idaho and Utah uh, come to mind as well. So, I mean, money is important. I mean, obviously you can't do the, uh, you can't fund any operation without funding. It's how you spend the money that's important and we don't need to get into that. And I'm not su suggesting that we're not, we're not doing a good job, but we need to be looking that way as well. I think if, as I look at the funding formula, I mean, if there were some way to craft it so that it is more nimble or more geographically aligned, uh, it would be excellent to do that because one size doesn't fit all. But the devil's in the detail, and that's why I that that's why I think that requires further analysis. If I were if I were going to criticize the funding formula, um, I would probably, I, I, and this I think substantiates Rob's uh, point. I would take a look at the at that minimum level, and say, this doesn't seem to make sense anymore. And so perhaps an infusion. I mean, leave the funding formula in place, but there there's something that we need to catch up. The other place I might look is what about that ma that cap level? Uh, you know what's you know what should we do? To, uh, I mean, there, there's a reason it's capped, so that extremely wealthy districts don't have a a, a great uh, uh, advantage over other districts. One could argue whether this is actually a good thing or not, but it's it's a it's the way our funding formula is put together, and it's the way our constitution is understood. But one could take a look at, at, at what the cap looks like as well. Uh, once again, preserving local communities' uh, desire, uh, ability to influence it, the quality of the education that they have. So I guess that's a long-winded way of saying uh, I think that I think there's ample reason to think that we don't have enough funding in the system. But here's the reality in the legislature, and there'll be the rela reality in your communities around the state. Uh, uh, more funding means someone's going to pay, and you're either going to see that on the uh, you know uh, burden placed on income taxpayers, which is more diffused, or you're going to see larger mandatory district levies uh, locally. That uh, that uh, people will ha you know our citizens are going to have to accept this as well, and that's that's I think where where we're going to find ourselves. One of the things Rob mentioned was um, the other the states around us that that invest more in education, um, and it was it was reminding me of something that was said in a meeting I was at pre, uh, last couple of days about how the average age of people in Montana is becoming much higher, um, and especially in relation to the states around us. And um, it was mentioned that you know people move here when they retire, and I I just don't think that's getting at the core of why that is the reason for why our, our age is, is rising. Um, 
I am a also have a background in early childhood education and I'm a strong advocate for early childhood education. And I think the two things that we are missing in our state is funding for early childhood and child care and funding for education. And a large increase in both of those could have an effect on the age of our population and encourage more people like myself who grew up in Montana and want to stay here and want to raise children here, be successful and able to do that. Um, and it's getting harder and harder. And so I want, to, I want to make sure that my children are able to do that. I want to make sure that I can stay in Montana and do that. Um, I, I took a $30,000 pay cut coming from Washington, teaching in Washington as a third year teacher to Montana. And I will not make up that $30,000 until I'm at least at um, year 18 in, in, on our current salary schedule, um, which is really challenging. And uh, the cost of living is not cheaper <laughs> in the Gallatin Valley than it was where I came from in Washington. In fact, uh, the median home price is higher in, in the Gallatin Valley than it was where I came from in Washington. So that's the challenge I think we face in, in ensuring that we are creating a community and a, and a state that we want to be proud of. Well, and, and I appreciate you all getting into a lot of the nuances of this <laughs> from your various vantage points. Um, and, you know, Becky, you just kind of scratched at this, but I, I was curious to, to kind of lift us back out of the weeds a little bit. <laughs> um, we're, we're talking a lot about, you know, funding for public education, but I think I, I'd like to have each of you kind of address how public education itself has sort of changed. I mean, when we're talking about this level of money, a need for an injection of cash, I, I, I hear a lot in my work from educators, from administrators, from lawmakers about how, you know, the, you know, demands on teachers, on, on how, you know, the classroom environment, on how public schools have changed over the decades. And I'm wondering if you could offer a little bit of context when we're talking about this kind of money, what is being funded? Like what, what has changed like as far as the scope of public education and the duties that it has that this money is, is bulwarking? Um, that one's very hard to address. Um, but I was thinking about what I heard from uh, teachers maybe a year or two ago, that when children were coming into the schools um, at the kindergarten level, approximately 50% of them were ready to start kindergarten, which means 50% of them were not. So the... Um, one of the things that we're only now beginning to do, which I think is a good thing, is to have some preschool education for kids who are at risk to not, for example, be able to read at level by third grade. Um, so there's been so many changes outside of schools in family life and everything else that has exacerbated those kinds of issues. I could also continue to point at the COVID um, experience that has led to probably more mental health issues for students. And I think teachers are, so many of them are the ones that are having to fill the gaps. And that just means more and more um, time and effort on their part for that. And then of course, just like anything else, I was, I was asking our, our school administrator who replaced Rob, I guess, um, about things that we weren't doing that we wanted to do because so much of our, we're using now one-time only kind of money again to fill holes. And so when you're talking about adopting new curricula, every new curriculum costs between 500,000 to a million dollars to put into place. And so there's those kinds of expenses. And then finally, this has nothing really to do with your question, but we've talked primarily about funding formulas. And I was wondering about whether we're in a position to, to do things like suggest to Northwest Energy, for example, that they shouldn't be charging schools the residential rate. I assume that they do, I don't really know. But given that people 
in their homes are paying that residential rate, they're also paying again to, to have schools be heated and air conditioned or whatever. And it seems like if we could make adjustments and things like that, so some of those fixed costs weren't where they are now. Um, and then finally, one real weed is this, prov this issue where you can now make donations to public schools for tax credits. So you can literally say up to $200,000 a year, which my income tax isn't that high, but for some people it might be. But you can take, say, $5,000 and say, I want that to go to the schools. I mean, it's, it's a tax credit. It's not a deduction. And so we should encourage more of that kind of um, uh, public involvement, I guess is all I'm saying. So I don't think I answered much of your question, except I think the mental health issues and the expectations that we have for kids and then the expectations for the teachers have grown immensely. I can add on if you'd like. Um, I think, yeah, I agree. I think one of the biggest things is the expectations we have for teachers and education. Um, and we can talk about all of the potential reasons for why it is, but, but the reality is, is students are coming in and you have students that are well prepared for school and you have students that are so far behind just entering kindergarten that it's gonna take a lot to catch up which requires a lot of effort on the classroom teacher, but then it also ends up requiring, that, I mean, the classroom teacher can't do it alone. So then you're starting to um, require interventionists that then have to provide more support. I myself am an interventionist. I think it's an amazing role that we serve in our schools, um, but that's creating more expense in how we have to intervene in these things. Um, behavioral interventionists were not something that we had in schools years ago, and now they are, imperative. Um, we have a behavioral interventionist in our school and without one, um, the, the, uh, the intensity of behaviors we are seeing um, would be resting on the classroom teacher's um, shoulders to address um, by themselves with 18 other students in the classroom or 28 other students in the classroom. Um, and so those kind of things are things that are adding to our um, costs, I think, in education, but then also just the desire for innovation. I think as we are entering a new age in education and in a new age in our world, um, we have to be more and more innovative. And to be more and more innovative, you need more and more funding because fun like innovation costs money. <laughs> and so that's another thing that I think is, is resting on the shoulders of schools. And I think our public schools are really trying to take it on is how can we be innovative? How can we provide more CTE in our schools? How can we provide more hands-on learning for our, our little ones so that they're more um, successful in life? So those are kind of the things that I think I'm seeing in our classrooms. Yeah, the only thing I would add, and it speaks right to what Becky was talking about, the biggest change I've seen over 30 years is the opportunities for kids. There's a lot more opportunities, and a lot of that is, is based on what the school is offering, what the teachers are doing, but the opportunities for kids is, is unlimited. And now we have the Digital Academy, even for rural areas, where you know they can provide some of those opportunities that you might only get in a larger school. So those types of things have changed. Um, one way to answer your question, Alex, is when you think about schools, I always think about them as a microcosm of their community. They have everybody that's in your community is also represented in your school. So you ask yourself, how has your community changed in the last 30 years? And schools have changed very similar that, to that. No teacher I've ever met doesn't want to be the most innovative um, teacher that they can be and provide those opportunities for kids. So every teacher that I know is working as hard as they can to provide more opportunity. Thoughts, David? <laughs> well, I'll uh, respond to, to your immediate question. I, I was not a classroom teacher, but my dad was. My late father was a, a teacher and a, an administrator. And uh, the, the world he taught in, in, starting in the 50s and ending in the 80s, was an awful lot different in terms of, of uh, what went on in the classroom. And I guess the perspective I got uh, talking to him uh, after he retired was 
he felt that when he first started as a teacher, there was more parent support of teachers than, the, than you have now. Um, and it, it made a, a big difference in his view of how education had changed to the point that he said, don't be a teacher to me. By that time, I was already an Army officer, so it didn't much matter. Um, you know, some of the things that were pointed out here, some of the expectations we have of the schools, uh, you know, to make sure kids are prepared when they uh, hit kindergarten and first grade uh, are important things. Uh, the various opportunities that kids have. One thing that we have done in the legislature, and I think we need to redouble our efforts, is, is we, we have instituted a, we call it targeted intervention preschool type program, uh, and we fund it. Uh, that, 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 that's the key thing. Uh, we do provide funding for those uh, uh, advanced opportunities, additional funding, and that's, that's an important aspect of what we're doing. And these things are, at, at least at, at right now, are outside of the funding formula. But those are, those are the sorts of things we can do to address that. What, you know, and much of this has been rec rather recent uh, developments within uh, education funding. And so, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to have this, uh, at least from my perspective, I don't want this to be too much of a downer sort of panel. But, the, you know, I think that we're sensing the, the kinds of changes that are necessary. And, and over the last couple sessions and into the next session, I think you're going to see uh, more work being done to address the concerns that, that we see at the legislature that are expressed down in the trenches where the education is actually going on. Um, if, there was a, if there was an easy solution to this, we would have already done it. Uh, uh, the best, the, I guess the best I can say is that, that at least I'll speak for myself and, and for most of my colleagues, I think, is that we recognize the challenges that are there and we're trying to, to manage, you know, where, how can we match funding to expectations uh, so that we can have the outcomes we want and still, be, and still be mindful of the fact that at the end of the day, someone is paying for those things and uh, sometimes what people want is different than what they're willing to pay for. I just wanted to add, I didn't say before, uh, another big change is school safety. Uh, and, and yes, there was a safety levy that was passed in Missoula for exactly that reason. And it runs from prevention, behavior interventionists, all the way through to infrastructure, locks, doors, and the rest. And that's something that's unfortunately there and new. And then I also wanted to thank the legislature actually for what what has been happening with the what I call the what what are called the public charters. These are charter schools that still are accountable to the school boards of trustees. And we have two now in Missoula, and there's about two dozen in the state. The two in Missoula, one has to do with the digital academy and the other is an arts integrated elementary for kids who, who learn better with this sort of hands-on arts kind of approach. Thanks, well that actually leads nicely into the last question. I, I wanted to end on a forward-looking, maybe hopeful note. <laughs> um, I mean, each of you, uh, you know, has you know, a, a different hand in, in this process um, as far as looking for fixes, looking for changes. Um, and from each of your levels, I'm curious, what in the near term, I mean, Becky, you talked about, you know, the decennial review, um, it, it, great opportunity, but the results won't be seen for, for a while. Uh, in the nearer term, I mean, what is a change, a fix, a, a you know, stop gap even that at, at each of your levels could be, you know, discussed, rolled out, that, that you're really kind of hoping to get, you know, into this conversation. And, and, and David, we can start with you because you've already kind of given us a little teaser <laughs> on, on where this is going in the next couple of weeks with the interim. Yeah, I guess I got ahead of myself a little bit on that one. Uh, so as I said earlier, I, I this is my uh, my guess. I'm only one of a hundred members of the House, and so I, I, what I say here is is like one hundredth of what's going to end up happening, probably. Um, 
I, I see uh, addressing the uh, shortfall and in inflation adjustments uh, by making a, 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 a change to funding that would be effective July 1, 2025 is, is in the art of the possible for, for the legislature. And as I mentioned earlier, that uh, the, uh, the components of, the, and I believe this, we're probably talking about bringing between 50 and 75 million, maybe a little bit more into the system. Um, don't, don't hold me to those numbers because this is still pretty, uh, uh, in, a, in, two, in two weeks we'll have a, a better handle on where we're going with that. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's our interest because of what we're hearing, understanding that teacher pay in general is, is an issue. Uh, it's my view and the view of several others that starting teacher pay uh, is where our, prior, our priority is. Um, I think that uh, continuing and expanding our support of advanced opportunities for students is another important thing. Uh, we've done that. I think we're going to, you're going to see an infusion of more cash to do that as well. And uh, the idea of, of, of a, uh, some sort of an allowance for housing stipends, which is still very embryonic, is, is uh, where we're at. I, will, I would like to say that you know, continuation of the, uh, of the targeted intervention preschool program is, is important, and there's no reason to think that that won't be uh, continued. It'll be interesting to see how many districts have taken advantage of that uh, across the state. And the public charter school uh, uh, legislation, I, I, I will say that, that we're gonna have to examine that one again only because the subscription rate to that was uh, about six times higher than, uh, than was expected. And so the uh, output of funds was a, a lot higher. And I, we haven't, I haven't had a discussion with anyone about funding level for that particular program. And just, you know, because not everyone in the room is, pro is, is up on public charters as well. A public charter school, you get, it, when you hear that, you probably have the notion of a building just got built and a bunch of kids are in it. But what it really has turned out to be, it's funding specialized programs uh, uh, and an infusion of additional, uh, significant additional funding into schools to set up programs within the existing school structure. I mean, you certainly could conceive of having a brick and mortar schoolhouse, but it hasn't been that way. And so this has been, this has been an innovation driver. Uh, I'd like to say that we're going to fully fund that for every school that wants to do it, but, but I, I just don't know enough about where we are on that right now. It's a fairly expensive program, but it's also a program that is, uh, I think, has a great deal of potential. So that's what I see in the short term. Uh, in the long term, you know, we, we've beat that pretty hard, I think. Um, I think uh, I've been following a little bit of what's been happening in this interim session with um, school funding, and I'm so appreciative that there is a conversation about the crisis that we are having and that, that something needs to be done before um, the decennial study. Um, I think from my perspective as a classroom teacher, I just want us to be aware that um, just getting to the inflationary gap is probably not going to be enough to fix the crisis. So um, just keeping that in mind as as and I'm hopeful that our legislature will keep that in mind, um, that our crisis is a lot more than just the inflationary gap. And like um, Arlene said, it, it, it was something that was happening prior to COVID, prior to the influx of the ESSER money. And I think the ESSER money, or maybe it was you, um, Representative Beatty, but that um, the ESSER money kind of just masked that. And it, it gave us some one-time money that we could get by, um, but now that's gone. And I think the the crisis has hit. And so I think that's just what I am hopeful for is addressed in the legislative session so we can keep our teachers and, and ensure that our students are getting a quality education and all students are getting a quality education. Well, people always say just throwing money at something doesn't really fix it, but I assure you that more money would fix a great deal. Um, and one of the things I did recently is I was looking at ACT scores and the correlation between the score and how much money a state puts in per student. And that correlation was 6.66. So it probably is, help. now there are many other things that are involved in that as well. But certainly more money is a nice fix. Um, the second though, I think is sort of demonstrated by having an audience that people being interested in and caring about their schools and 
and the children that are coming up, um, even if they don't have ch any children or if their children are grown, is terribly significant as well. Um, I'm one of seven children, and when my mother would complain about her taxes, I used to say, when I was an adult, not as a kid, um, Mother, you will never put back into the system what we took out. If you have seven children having 12 years, I'm sorry, seven children and 12 years of school each, you will never repay that money. Other people actually, income taxes and property taxes um, made that difference. So I think getting people aware that basically the amount of taxes, property taxes, any one of us pays on average pays for one kid 12 years of schooling. Um, so we need everybody interested in, in educating the next generation. And so somehow returning an emphasis to education as a way of creating an informed citizenry as it was started rather than as a workforce would be, to me, paramount. Reminding people that education is responsible for critical thinking and things of that sort, not just the job you'll have when you're 38 years old. Um, so I, I guess I sound like a, um, a left-wing liberal, but to me that is what education's all about. And I can see it in my own family, again, of seven kids with varying levels of education and then look at how different our lives are depending upon that very education. So if we can find a way to remember to put that to me, to me that is front and central. What I most care about is education. And you can look at my life and see that that's the case. But I just wish it were more so to many more people. So that's not a real good answer, but mine. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to end on a positive note as well to your suggestion, Alex, and I'll start with what won't work, but I will tell you what I think will work. And both of these are related to two bills that passed in the last session. What won't work for us as a system is to stand up an entirely separate private system using public money. Uh, we had a bill that passed in the last session, House Bill 393, I think it was, was an education savings account, and that is actually being implemented, and how it works is that a family could decide to um, access this education savings account to use on private education, but in order to access it, they have to pull their child out of public school. And then the money that the school would have normally received for that child goes into a savings account for the family that they can use on pretty much almost anything they want to. There is some limits in the bill, but there's very little accountability with regards to what they use that money on. Education savings account is a really nice way to say school voucher. That's exactly what it is. School vouchers are something that's new to Montana, and that's something that will not work. Several other states have shown that it has not worked. If we're gonna use our public money to stand up a private system outside the public system, then we might as well just follow what Arizona has done, what Utah has done, those systems do not work, and that's something that won't work in this next, leg next legislative session. That current bill only serves special education students, uh, but that's just a toe in the water. I think the next step will be, someone will suggest that we need to make those vouchers universal for any student in the state of Montana. Utah did that two years ago. This year they have 10,000 students accessing vouchers. So it, it comes very quickly. And if you want to know what won't work, it's using our very limited resources and diverting them to an entirely private system outside the public system. What will work, um, one suggestion that did pass from the last session, um, the state, you probably caught this during the last session, the state infused 300 million into behavioral health. Not just behavioral health for adults, but behavioral health for kids. Some of that money is still on the table and hasn't been spent yet. Some of that money will be decided in this next session on how to spend it. We talk about the needs of behavioral health in schools. Remember I told you earlier that your schools are a microcosm of your community? That's very true in your schools with, with regards to behavioral health. 
um, students that need that support, we can use some of that money to offer school-based behavioral health. So that's something that will work with money that's already been allocated. We just need to make a decision on how to spend it. Great. Well, I want to turn it over to some audience questions while we've got some time. So, okay, I've got, let's, let's start there and then go there. <laughs> Um, you talked a little bit about the, the, the voucher program and such, but where I I'm, I'm, I'm really have a question is, what is the financial impact to the overall school funding for remote learning, homeschooling, and, um, oh gosh, what was the other one that I was thinking about? Oh, uh, the uh, charter schools. I, I, I haven't quite been able to follow that. What is the financial impact, if any? Um, of those on the funding for the public schools? I, uh, well, first of all, I think it's pretty complex. I mentioned there's approximately 150,000 kids in school, of school age in Montana, and 99% of them go to public schools. So it's a small number who are either homeschooled or going to private schools. But for example, this special ed one, it's $8,000. Well, if a person takes their child out of the school, the school loses $8,000. Um, the number of kids who need special ed changes. It may be that the school can no longer afford to have a special ed teacher when one or two or three kids leave. Um, and $8,000, as far as I can see, will buy you absolutely nothing in the private sector if your kid has special education needs. So it's hard to tell you exactly how it's affecting it, but it certainly is, it's, again, like one child leaving doesn't reduce a family's um, bill by 20%, even though they're 20% of the total. But every one of those ch children who, who leaves makes a cascade of other things that happen within the school. So, and, and that's probably why it's so hard to tell you, you know, exactly how that works. Because it's, it's not uniform across schools, grade levels, uh, what the child needs, and all the rest of it added up. I guess is all I can say. Somebody might be able to do a better job than I did with that, but. I think you did a great job, but I'll, I'll, let me try to parse it. The first question is, what, what effect has the, the public charter schools had? That's a positive effect. That is additional uh, uh, money going to public school districts to set up those programs. That's a positive effect. The uh, homeschool uh, children, the, the effect there is that, is that because the child isn't uh, attending the school, uh, because the funding formula is based upon enrollment, you'll have less uh, money coming in. On the other hand, you have fewer students that you're, that you're educating. Once again, it's not a, it, there's a granularity problem here as well. Um, the, let's see, the th I guess I'll, I'll talk about the uh, education savings accounts for special needs. And I'm going to confess, I haven't thought that much about uh, this one because uh, I am not as concerned about private charter schools. I think the action in Montana, given our demographics and our economy, is that almost all students are going to be uh, educated in the public schools. And I think the public schools can compete and win. But that's, that's just my competitive nature. Um, with respect to the education, uh, special education education savings account, I guess if I wanted to study that further, what I would want to look at is what the outlay of money is going to be. But also on the on the flip side, uh, many special uh, needs students uh, require uh, su substantial additional funding, which local school districts uh, can raise through what are called tuition levies that are outside of the funding formula. So it's possible you could have a net savings in some circumstances, but this is, I, I, I'm simply going to say this, this one is a complicated one to figure out what the actual impact is. If you really wanted to study it, I, I'd have to get my legislative fiscal analysts working on, on this particular problem, because I actually think it's a, it's a great question, but I can't, I can't be specific on that one. All I can do is tell you what the, what the dynamics are. 
You asked about remote learning, and I think probably um, one thing to note about the Montana Digital Academy is those are Montana teachers employed by Montana school districts. And uh, the money that's used to run that program, partially from the legislature, mostly from the legislature, but also partially from local school districts, they have a cost sharing mechanism now where local school districts need to put up a little bit of money for kids that are enrolled in the Digital Academy. Uh, most of those kids stay in the public system, so it's not an issue like you're losing them to a, a remote learning situation. You're actually, they're actually gaining more opportunities um, by taking those academy classes. Okay, so we had one here. I look at our education system as our most important business. And the product of that business is the quality of our future. And whenever I look at a company to invest in, I always look at its competition. Um, Colorado has a population of six million people. Uh, Idaho, two million. Um, Montana, a little over one. Colorado has 178 school districts. Uh, Idaho, 128. We've got 302. That's a lot of administrative overhead. Why is that? Ed, I mean, Rob. <laughs> Sorry, but <laughs> who's going to kick us off? Uh, I'll kick this one off, but I'm not going to use a word that starts with C. Um, consolidation. Okay, I used it. Um, <laughs> so first of all, actually, Montana has about 397 school districts when you add them all up, and, and but it makes your point even even greater. There is an administrative cost with running that many school districts, and it's a, it's an artifact of I guess the way the the state was settled. Uh, there have been there there the school districts can voluntarily consolidate in order to save costs that has not proven to happen ever or often because people have a sense of identity with their schools and their school districts that's that's where we are right now now one thing that uh, and 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 so um, so we have that particular we have that particular dynamic and I, I I've heard many people uh, I, I've heard many concerns about that, but I, I guess I will be the politician that I am. I, I, the, 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 when you, I mentioned the word consolidation, that is, that is kind of like using the word sales tax in the state of Montana. Uh, it's, it may be a good idea, but it's, uh, it's time is not here because the people of Montana are, have not expressed an interest in it. So almost 400 school districts, but actually we only have just over 200 superintendents in the state. So many of those districts share their superintendent or the superintendent is in charge of two districts. Um, administrative overhead is a really broad topic. Um, you know, every school should and needs a school librarian. And so it doesn't matter if you have five schools or 10 schools, you're gonna have to have at least one librarian for all of them. Um, custodial staff is also considered overhead. Uh, lunch, lunch programs are considered overhead. So it, it is a great question. It does come back to consolidation. It comes back to local control. Um, I have, there's two small districts up by Kalispell that are looking at consolidation, but it's gonna require a vote of both districts. Both districts have to agree to consolidate. And that, um, that's a big lift. Actually, I was gonna say Missoula is officially a consolidated district at the high school level because actually I'm the representative for Bonner and Target Range on the Missoula. So our high school pulls kids from K to eight districts all around, but that's pretty unusual too. Can we have one right up there? Yeah. Hi, my question um, kind of gets to Rob's um, view of schools reflecting our communities and how we all intersect. Um, I have the privilege of sitting on the school board with Arlene, but also I sit at these anesthesiology recruitment dinners. And as we have a, an aging population in Montana who are needing more and more surgeries, we are having an incredibly hard time recruiting anesthesiologists statewide. Um, and when we sit at these dinners, one of the things that comes up is how are the schools? It's hard to attract people if they don't see themselves raising their children in great schools. And David, you said more money for schools someone has to pay. But we had a $2 billion surplus in our budget. Um, we also, as Montana Free Press reported this week, 
We have a governor who spent seven, over seven million of his personal dollars on anti-public school organizations. So there's an impression that our legislature doesn't value public education or there's a devaluation of education at the state level. Can you speak to that more? I'll try. First of all, I'll defend the, uh, the, the budget surplus. Uh, had a lot of people with their eyes on what to do with that budget surplus. We were not going to fix uh, the long-term public school funding problem with one-time only money. And so uh, what the legislature did in response to this uh, unprecedented surplus, which was driven by arguably by the infusion of federal money, which juiced our economy, but we can talk about that uh, in a different uh, setting. So what we did with that is we put, uh, we paid down state debt, we invested in $300 million in mental health, we, had a ta we have a property tax uh, rebate program, which is meant to be a bridging mechanism as we uh, redo, uh, as we uh, put forward thoughtful solutions to the property tax problem. And I probably, well, we also had a, a, a tax rebate, so I, I, a income tax rebate. So I think I can defend all of the money that's there. Your second point is the devaluation of education. And I suppose that you have a certain cadre of, of legislators that, that uh, have a negative attitude about, uh, about public education, but I, I serve in the majority party and, uh, and have, and, and I, I'm, I'm uh, affiliated with a, a group of legislators who are strongly pro-public education. And in fact, I, I'm, I, I'm gonna pat my colleagues on the back on this. The uh, progress we've made in public education funding, at least over the last, since the 2019 session, has been on the backs of those uh, Republican legislators uh, with help of our, of our Democrat friends to get uh, le uh, legislation across the finish line. Now, not everyone is going to be happy with the outcome. Uh, more money, uh, I, someone does pay money eventually. Uh, you, we must balance a budget. This is not the federal government. And we have to be mindful of the other demands that are on the, st on, on the state. But uh, I think that we're doing a, I think that, uh, I think that uh, I'll speak for myself and my colleagues. We value public education and, and we have demonstrated that by the, by the legislation that we put forward that has introduced more funding for advanced opportunities, uh, has inter finally introduced uh, funding for targeted intervention for at-risk preschool students, and uh, yeah, I could go down the list, uh, more money for uh, major maintenance uh, uh, repairs across the state, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is, uh, I, I, I think we, we serve uh, ourselves better if we can consider the challenge we have in education to be a, a nonpartisan problem. And uh, yeah, there'll, there'll be partisans on both ends of the uh, spectrum. So, uh, I, I have colleagues that are solidly anti-public school. They're a minority. I also have colleagues on the other side who, who believe that that the only solution that, that's necessary is more money. I reject that as well. I'm a moderate. Okay, we've got time for one more, and we're gonna go, okay. Sorry, I, I, I have a hard time choosing. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go here. Um, yeah, and yeah, let's make it a good one. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, I hope so. Um, I want to make one comment that has to do with the biggest change. I uh, have I served on the last decennial commission, and um, and was a teacher and a school board member. And the thing that came out in that last commission uh, has been a change that's been going on for some time, which is the portion of special education and who's picking it up. Special education costs are extremely high depending on the disability of the student involved and there's a legal requirement to meet that need where there isn't a legal requirement to meet the need for uh, other students and over the course of the last 30 years that shift from the federal government paying absorbing the greatest percentage of that uh, and the state the next greatest and then the locals the least has flipped and so the very thing that you're talking about, Arlene, with, um, you know, you can go to the local district 
and they will pay for special education needs, but it just increases the, the burden on the local taxpayer. And uh, the state has not picked up that piece of the uh, portion, and it's, it's substantial. But having said that, I, I want to challenge you a little bit on the whole thing of innovation and what a great thing it is that we're spending this money on these uh, public charters. You know how I feel about the private ones. Uh, because you're taking money to do these innovative things while we are not meeting the, the basic, I mean, you laid off 60 teachers, uh, so, and, but you chased after this other money uh, that, that provides a frill at the expense of the basics. So tell me I'm wrong. Can I address both of those for just a minute? Oh, the first one about the, the special ed, I'm actually going to be in D.C. next week talking to our delegation again about IDEA, which is what pays for special ed. And the feds are supposed to fund 40%, and they fund approximately 14%, which leaves uh, the state and then 67% is funded locally. So that's certainly something that needs to change. Okay, The other, I understand what you're saying, but I wouldn't consider the public charters as a frill, and again, they're still within the public schools, but rather, in some ways, they're like experimental situations as well. For example, so, for example, using the art integrated teaching in this one uh, elementary public charter, starting with only two grades and then moving to being larger, gives us an opportunity to develop innovations that can be brought into um, the regular classroom. So I think to some extent, um, that's a, I mean, not to some extent, that is a good thing. Um, and again, they have to meet the same qualifications, unlike, quote, community choice, private charters. Um, but they have to meet the same um, rules and regulations that all public schools must meet. I just have one thing to add that might help answer that. You know, uh, what I have noticed is uh, some of the education policy bills that have come out are sort of what I would describe as a carrot and a stick in that we're encouraging you to do this innovative program and in order to get the um, money you have to do this innovative program. So great example, and, and it goes back to what I said earlier that one size does not fit all. Great example being the early literacy bill, which by the way was my favorite bill of the last session. I guess you're not supposed to have a favorite, but that was my favorite bill of the last session was the early literacy bill. Uh, because I know the importance of getting kids to read by grade level on third grade. Um, I was in uh, Glasgow two days ago. There were 20 superintendents there. I asked them how many are accessing that early, early literacy program. None of them are accessing that program, which was a heartbreaker for me because that was my favorite bill. And I talked a lot about it, and I encouraged them to do it throughout the session and even this fall or last spring. None of them were accessing it. When I asked a simple question, why aren't you accessing that, they, they couldn't find the staff. It's not that they didn't want to do the program and they wanted that extra money, but they, don't they, couldn't, they couldn't find staff to do it. So that's an example of a wonderful solution, one that I completely support, but doesn't work in every situation. It goes back to what I said earlier. We have to have these conversations throughout the state to figure out what's working and what's not working, and talking to our legislator about this might work great in some areas, but it's not going to work everywhere. That's, that's, what I, that's how I phrase that charter school bill, if you look at the communities that applied for that, it works in those communities. It's not working for all of our communities. Any other thoughts? Well, I'll just, uh, uh, I'll, I'll talk on special education. Uh, so I did read the last decennial study. It was the basis for me doing the legislation that brought the special education funding into the funding formula because it, resi it was an orphan uh, prior to that. Uh, a, a, a problem with special education funding is that we have an unfunded mandate from the federal government and they don't even pick up their portion of it. Uh, and, and I hate to sound be repetitive here, 
but everything that we want to do has a price tag and someone ends up paying. And so the way it works now is the, the state has a, uh, a, a contribution it makes as part of the funding formula. And that funding comes from, a, you know, the dollars lose their color once they get into the, the pot. It's either 90, you can call it 95 mil money, property tax money or income tax money, but it's money that's collected by the state. And for those special, uh, uh, those special education students that have uh, uh, their, their uh, IEPs, their programs have ex uh, uh, exceptional high, exceptionally high costs, school districts pick up the burden by levying a tuition levy or, or have the op option to do that. So the mechanism is there. I think the real qu uh, question uh, that, you, that you raise is, is it becomes a value question. And that question is who should pay? Should should the should taxpayers across the state pay for the excess costs for a special education student uh, in order to fully fund the, their their education, or should that be a burden placed upon uh, the local uh, the ta property tax owners in the uh, property tax payers in the uh, in the school district? And the and it's the latter case that we that we have adopted at this point. I just want to add on to, to Rob's point about the, um, the early literacy program. That was also my favorite bill. Um, as an early childhood educator, I've been fighting for, for early childhood education in the state for years, and that felt like such a big win. Um, but it is really disappointing how many, how many districts are not taking, um, up, taking that up. And in Belgrade, we do have a program, and it is not fully staffed. Um, we don't have a para in our program. We have a teacher with 18 four-year-olds in a classroom and no para. And it's devastating to me when I see it because I'm so passionate about that program. Um, but that's what we face with our innovative programs is we can, we can come up with innovative programs and, and fund them even, but if we are not fully funding education, those innovative programs are not going to be successful. All right. Well, that's kind of a dour note to Sorry. end on, but we do have to wrap it up. Um, I just wanted to take a minute to thank each and every one of these panelists for offering their time. Thank you for coming to this uh, occasionally weedy conversation. Um, and yes, um, thank you so much, all of you. And if you have an all-conference pass or if you purchased a luncheon ticket, lunches through those double doors, if you have a pass or purchased a luncheon ticket. <laughs>